Bruno is president of the National University of Health Sciences. Dr. Winterstein is also a scholar, mentor, visionary, and friend. Please help me to welcome Dr. Winterstein.
former Governor Lamb of Colorado. I listened to him one time, and his whole speech was on thinking in different terms. And you know he was controversial because he, he was one of those people that espoused that we need to think about things differently. He took a lot of flack for it, and he probably may have deserved it, but I think he hit a point right on the head. We can't remain static. We lack cultural status. We're not reimbursed properly. I was just talking to a good friend here this morning, and a lot of the conversation had to do with that issue. We still only treat 7 to 8% of the population, and we remain severely divided. Our primary tenets as a profession, notice I'm not using the word philosophy, it's been misused so often in our profession, to mean what we believe is true. And instead of using the meaning as it should be used, philosophy is the search for and the love of wisdom. We use it to represent our so-called tenets, which are rooted in dogma. I'm going to say that again. They're dogmatic because what we've done is taken what we believe to be true and made it the truth without the evidence that is necessary to support it. Charles Peirce, a relatively modern day philosopher, in his search for wisdom, talked about epistemology. Epistemology is the study, is one of the five pillars of philosophy, and it is the study of how do we know that what we believe is true really is true. And he said there are four ways of knowing. The method of tenacity. If this sounds like our profession, there's a reason for it. The method of tenacity is this. I know this is true, let's say subluxation, because I believe it is true, and therefore it must be true. The second method is the method of authority. I know this is true because B.J. said it's true, or D.D. said it's true, or Joe Jancy said it's true, or Jay Winterstein said it's true. The third is the a priori method. I know this is true because it makes sense. It stands to reason. And the fourth is the method of science. I know this is true because there has been objective study outside of my ability to influence that tells me it's true. Now, where are we as a profession in that little paradigm of truth. We reside at number one and number two almost exclusive. Still, no excuse for that anymore. Admissions to DC programs are decreasing. One institution just closed. Twelve of the 19 chiropractic programs in 2010 showed a decline in admissions. This should be a signal to all of us that we have to Change. I told you I was sick. Remember? Do we wait until we're in the ground? Why? Why are the uh, admissions going down? Platitudes and self assurances won't fix our dilemma. All of our planning so far hasn't really changed anything. I give great credit to the ACA and the Association of Chiropractic Colleges who have worked hard to make change in the profession. But it hasn't changed anything. And Rick, you'll excuse me, I'm not being critical of all of your efforts. I know how hard you guys work. I've had a representative at all the summits. Yes, we've made some political inroads along the way, but as a profession, we're still the same. We haven't answered the question why. Other professions are succeeding. Look what physical therapy has done. Look at how much effort all of us have made to keep them from doing what we think is our own. Well, the reality, my friends, is that nothing is our own. People can learn and they can do. Optometry, nursing, physician assistant, psychologist, osteopathic medicine, naturopathic medicine, oriental medicine, acupuncture, all of these other professions have made progress. All have planned, changed, grown, they've undergone, we have undergone, undergone entropy. What are we missing? What single characteristic is shared by every profession that is succeeding? It's called scope expansion. Amber needs to be able to make a living. Yes, 
People get out of school and make a living today, but there's too much scamming going on. And we're here to serve the public. Expansion of education, academic rigor, entrance GPA, science-based tenants. That's where we need to go, in my opinion. Just for your information, National has, a, has required the baccalaureate since 1999 for admission into its institution. Next year, the entrance GPA goes to 2.75. When we were having the Higher Learning Commission do its site visit in Florida at our new program there, Neil Hattelstadt, who was the head of the site team, a PhD, and I met privately. He said, Jim, I know about your profession, and I know where National is in terms of chiropractic education, and you'll forgive me if I boast a little here. But he said, you're leading the pack. Now take the next step and go with a GPA that is equivalent to what all of the graduate schools require. And we have. And everybody needs to. That's academic rigor. It has to happen. If you go and try to apply in a PA school and you don't have a 3.0, you're not going to get in. It's a PA school. In the late 60s when they started out as uh, army medics, which is what I was at one time, and they decided they ought to be able to do something in civilian life, they started the PA school. It was two years after high school. Today it's a master's degree. What is the rate of clinical utilization of chiropractic medicine? 43 years ago when I graduated it was 6%. Today it's 7 or 8%. Reimbursement when I graduated was virtually none from third parties. What were those the good old days? Today we're headed in the same direction. Back down to those so-called good old days. They don't work anymore because everybody's in the third party today. Are we avoiding the real tough questions? Well, one of the tough ones, I think, is subluxation. And I heard there were some buttons here. Um, and, and I'm going to give you my perspective on this. It has to go. Now, I realize Medicare, that's OK. We have to do what we have to do with Medicare. But we need to change the statute. At some point, we have to work in that direction. Because we don't have evidence of its science-based reality. Charles Peirce would say subluxation is based in tenacity. I know it's true because I believe it to me, because I adjust people and they get better. That doesn't mean that subluxation had anything to do with it at all. It simply means that when we manipulated the spine or adjusted the spine, there was a response. We talk about the dominance of the nervous system. Is it an accurate concept? And finally, our professional ethics. How strong are they? In terms of the subluxation, you know that was part of the ACC paradigm. I want to say to you all, so everybody hears it from this lecture, I rescinded my name from that paradigm long ago. That was designed initially to be an, an effort on the part of the educational institutions to come together. But it was to be a beginning, not an end. Unfortunately, people picked it up and made it the total. And it, and it left us with a lot of issues that we can't resolve because there's no evidence to resolve. So I took my name off of it, just so every one of you knows that. So under or less than luxation, a dislocation. This bone is slightly out of place. No, it's not. We don't have that evidence. If you could tell me that there is evidence, I'd like to see it. Is it a necessary construct? We say that without that, we're nothing. I don't agree with that at all. We'll see in a minute. Is it a damaging construct? Well, let's take a look at the Canadian study done in chiropractic business in fall of 2000. They did a survey of the public, and they said, what do you think about subluxation? You know what the public said to the Canadian people? The cameras that did this, they said, um, I don't know what it is, but if I have it, I better go to my MD and find out about it. It scares me. It turned out to be negatively impacting the public's uh, consideration of chiropractic care. We like to avoid those kinds of surveys because they aren't what we want to hear. Dominance of the nervous system. Is the nervous system dominant? We always say, 
the body is completely controlled by the nervous system. Everything that happens, and look at the websites of, your, of, of the chiros, and you'll see it on almost all of them. Is it true? May not be true. In fact, if we studied mechanobiology, which is an upcoming uh, science-based physiologic concept, we'll find out that there is a, a whole different side to the way the body functions. It's right up our alley, and we're missing it completely. Connective tissue, a body-wide signaling system. Medical Hypotheses 2006. Dynamic fibroblast cytoskeletal response to subcutaneous, subcutaneous tissue stretch. Ex vivo and in vivo, American Journal of Physiology. Mechanotherapy, it's how physical therapists' prescription of exercise promotes tissue repair. Mechanotransduction is the physiological process where cells sense and respond to mechanical loads. Never mind them going through the nervous system. They talk to each other directly. <clears throat> From the article of Matt McKenna, the transduction just cited, this remarkable, ubiquitous, non-neural physiological process, the process by which cells convert mechanical stimuli, and you see adjusting and manipulation here, into biochemical responses. Mechanobiology and diseases of mechanical transduction, Annals of Medicine, 2003. It's already almost a decade old. Examples of such disease contributions include asthma, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, diabetes, stroke, and heart failure. Biomechanical effects on the human body that don't go through the nervous system don't have to have anything to do with subluxation. Dominance of the nervous system? Maybe not what we thought. You know, professional ethics. How does the public see us? Time after time, article after article. Just last week, big article, was it the week before? Los Angeles Times on back pain. Not one mention of our profession. Every other profession, not ours. Why is that? We complain that we've been discriminated against, and I know that. I was your expert witness in the 87 Wilk trial, which you probably don't know. So that's close to my heart. I realize we were discriminated against. But you know, sometimes you have to grow up, quit whining, and get on with the process. We're a profession, or we claim to be. A profession has certain qualities. And it's time for us, as a profession, to become, or as a desired profession, to become one, to become a healthcare discipline. We have practice builders, patient scammers. We have ads in our professional newspapers that would make most people gag. And yet, we do it every day. We see it every day and we don't do anything about it. I go to conventions, and I'm just glad we're not a bunch of proctologists, because what would we be doing at all those tables? That uh, we see chiros adjusting each other? You know, even if you were a proctologist, we'd have a bunch of people with their butts in the air. <laughs> we don't act like a profession most of the time, or much of the time. If the adjustment is so valuable and so significant, why do we treat it as if it is a convention thing we can do on anybody? And then we go there and we see people sitting with their feet in brown water, taking the toxins out and all that stuff. It's no wonder the public thinks poorly of this. <clears throat> Dynamic chiropractic, gallop pull. Ethics and honesty. There are the nurses right at the top, and by the way, they've been at the top for a long time. And there we are at the bottom. And this has been repeated over and over and over. When will we pay attention? I know I'm preaching to the choir. But it's time for us to quit ragging on big on, on allopathic medicine and, and and all the problems there. 
and clean up our own house, and I have to move more quickly. What do we think? Is it ethical to promote lifetime adjustments? Where's the evidence? What about overutilization? Doesn't help to call the kettle black. When we gather for any reason, what dominates our conversation? Chiropractic. Not patience. What does the public think its doctors should know and, and do? Is it about wellness? Is it about nutrition? About spinal analysis? No. You know, the one thing that identifies the doctor in the eyes of the public is the drugs. And I don't like that term at all. I never had the need for people to take drugs in my practice, believe it or not. But I think that that's the way the public sees it. Go into any room other than this one. Go down the hall to the woodworkers convention. Walk in and just say, doctor, and what does everybody think? Immediately. They don't think PhD, they don't think DC, dentist, optometrist, they think MD. Now, I know how those people got there and how they developed that monopoly. We could whine about that forever. What do we do? Prescriptive rights? <clears throat> Too many drugs? Why in the world do we want to go there? Let me tell you something. If we want to progress as a profession, we have to look at this thing with our eyes wide open. The people in New Mexico have done it. The people in Alabama are doing it. Um, the people in South Carolina are doing it. I say, good for you. The profession must change. We don't want our tombstone to say, I told you I was sick. Does that mean we have to lose what we have always been? No, except for the dog. Clinical authority is an important thing that people don't realize. I believe that when it comes to drug therapy, on the average, I'm not talking about the advanced drugs, uh, chemotherapy, all that kind of thing, but the thing that people take every day. Rick, I'd rather have you be controlling that because you're going to think about it in a different way than the MD does. Now we say, ah, if we go that way, we'll go the way of the osteopaths. Hey, that wouldn't be all bad. There are 70,000 of them. Did you know that? You know, when I was in school, there were like 20,000. Less than that, 13,000. There are 70,000 DOs today. Yes, we say they become like the MDs. They have not given up their osteopathic heritage. And they don't intend to. But they're in a position to do it without interference. We could be separate and distinct. We need to be, how about separate and extinct? We're headed there. If we don't change. A profession that is in decline is of no real value. Our best clinical tool has been taken by others and is being used on a regular basis. What have we got left? Well, I can tell you what we have left. It's how we think about health and disease. That's what we are. We're people who think conservatively. If Rick was in a position to do, to prescribe some basic medications, antihypertensives, some antibiotics, yes, some analgesics, and a few other things, armor, thyroid, and some other things like that, I would much rather go to him because I know he's not going to give me five, six medications right off the bat. But when the patient comes into his office and is on five or six medications and he recognizes that there are contraindications going on, adverse reactions and interactions, he has no authority to take them off of the drug. You can't take somebody off of something that you don't have the authority to give them in the first place. So what do we do as DCs? We say, oh boy, I see this person is taking three different antihypertensives. Um, I think that it would be better if they were taking one at the most, and I can do something with their lifestyle. Uh, you know what, Mrs. Jones, maybe if you were my monitor, I might suggest that you consider not taking, ah, you're in trouble right there, aren't you? Not if you had prescriptive rights. Regardless of the current rhetoric, the system still thinks primarily about the treatment of disease, just the way it is. We, as a profession, need to think about optimal health doesn't come from a pill, a can, or a bag, nor from an adjustment. Putting somebody on an adjustment a month for the rest of their life, there is no evidence. Now, I know what you're going to say because I'm the same way. I raised my kids that way. 
because it worked fine, but we still don't have the evidence. To just say it works is not the answer, and we know that. It has gotten us nowhere. We still treat 7 to 8 percent of the population. Think in different terms, and the different terms should be optimal health. Promotion of exercise, excellent knowledge of nutrition, not just selling supplements. We need to know about these things. Stress reduction techniques, and it should be spelled a little differently. Mechanotransduction. Let's start to think about our profession and what we do in a physiologic concept that is acceptable. Teaching people how to avoid and quit unhealthy habits. Teaching people not to be obese, not through fad diets, but how they should eat so that they aren't obese. Teaching them about necessary supplementation. Learning and promoting new legitimate health, promoting information. I'm thinking for just as an example, this whole body vibration thing. We need to know about these things. Opening our minds to reality. Providing what people need, not what we want them to have. Start thinking about our patient rather than the sacred cows of our profession. What does the public need? It needs primary care. If we don't know that by now, we sure haven't been paying much attention, have we? The public needs primary care. There is no way the allopathic profession can meet the need nor the nursing profession. We have a golden opportunity to jump into the, into the uh, health care scene in a much bigger way. Lou Sportelli and I, for many years, have talked about what we saw as chiropractic physicians in our office. We treated everybody who came in, or at least managed them. Uh, and you know, that's what, that is what the uh, Institute of Medicine expects of a primary care professional, to manage the majority of people who came in, to coordinate care with the secondary providers and with the family and with the community. We can do that right now. We can do it a little better if we have some scope expansion. We can help fill the gap. What does it take? <clears throat> you know, if you're going to jump a chasm, George said, don't be afraid to take a big step. You can't do it in two. And we need to take a big step. Expanded education to include residencies, divesting ourselves of the old dogma, use of all the tools we have now, and use of a limited prescriptive formulary, I think, are the tools we need to get where we should be in the near future. Jump the chasm. Recognize the right of some to move ahead. I always hear this. Well, does that mean you're better than me? Well, I don't know. I'm a diplomat in radiology. Does that mean I'm better? It means I know something that you probably don't know, which is why some of you refer to your patient, your x-rays to me to be read. That's okay. We've been there for years. The tiered profession, we've always had a tiered profession. Uh, Dr. Jancy was the one who said, legislate as broadly as possible so you can practice as narrowly as you wish. Fine. Some people are going to be unhappy with it. That's okay. Let's promote primary care. And if I don't get finished here in another little bit, um, Donna's going to come and hit me with her, her boot that she's got on there. Not primary care of the spine. There is no such thing. Primary care is primary care. Recognize it for what it is, and I just told you what the Institute of Medicine says. Those who wish to specialize in spine care, great, go do that. What would it take to make us different? Conservative care, it's all about how we think. As regulators, you should be willing to take a look at your statutes. Many are outdated. Many are based on the dogma of subluxation. Choices are ours. We can stick to the old ways and die within 20 years or take some bold steps into the future. Whatever you can do, or dream you can do it, do it with, do it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. Begin it now. And in closing, you know, Dr. Jancy always likes to misquote Kip, uh, uh, Kipling. And uh, in his poem, uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, Stranger at My Gate, there's a little section. It wasn't exactly the way Dr. Jancy said it, but he used it so well. He said, here's to the men and women of my own breed. 
good or big or bad as they might be, at least they hear the things I hear and see the things I see. And that's what I say to you today. Thank you.